Matthew chapter 8. So for those that are visiting for the first time, just so you know, um, on, on Tuesdays we're currently going through the book of Matthew. So every service we're just going chapter by chapter and today we're up to Matthew chapter 8. But look at Matthew chapter 8 verse 27. Verse number 27, Matthew 8, 27. This is after Jesus Christ calms the storms and the seas. It says in verse 27, But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? The title of the sermon tonight is, What manner of man? Okay? And then this is, a, this is something that the disciples are saying to themselves because they're seeing just the, the amazing miracles that Jesus Christ has been doing. You know, He's been healing the sick. He's been casting out devils. And we get to the point where even nature itself obeys the commands of Jesus Christ. They're like, what manner of man is this? You know, who are we dealing with here? You know, ultimately, they knew who he was. They had placed their faith in him. But still, as they saw him performing all these miracles, it just amazed them. It just, it just uh, made them realize, wow, you know, this, this, this Jesus is, is a great God. But let's start off in verse number 1. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. And when he was come down from the mountain... Great multitudes followed him. Now, this is something you'll notice in the ministry of Jesus Christ. That as, as he was going from town to town, from village to village, from city to city, there would be great multitudes following after Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, one thing, if you read the Bible, you, you come to realize this. Is that this wasn't Jesus' preferred way of doing ministry. Okay? It, it was great that he had the multitudes. And, and he, he taught them. And he healed them. But it's not the way he had planned to go about his ministry. He had planned to go from city to city. You know, and, and, and one thing with the multitudes, it was something that would slow him down. And I want to bring that to your attention because as you read through the Gospels, you'll notice Jesus says certain things and you might be scratching your head. Why is Jesus saying that? And we'll look at that soon. Look at verse number two. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him. Hey, what do you think this leper has realized about Jesus Christ? Are we commanded to worship man or an angel? No. You know, the Bible very clearly instructs us that we only are to worship the one Lord God, the God of the Bible. And so when we see the leper come and worship Jesus, what do you think he's admitting to right there? He's admitting to the deity of Jesus Christ. He's admitting that he's placing his faith and his worship on Jesus Christ. What does he say in verse number two? Saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And you know what? I think that's a great way for us to bring our prayers and supplications before Jesus Christ, before God. It's say, like, God, look, this is something, I, I, these are needs that I have to be met. These are sicknesses that I'm struggling with. But Lord, if thou wilt, if it's your will, Lord, you can make me clean. Lord, if, if it's your will, you can provide me these needs. If it's your will, you can heal me from these sicknesses and these illnesses. It's a great way to approach God in prayer. Let's look, look verse number three. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. I want you to notice that, that he touched this man. This was a, a, a leper, okay? It, the danger was if you touch someone with leprosy, that you could become contaminated by that same sickness. This is why lepers were required to be away from the camp, away from the city, so they wouldn't affect other people. But we see Jesus with his compassion, with his love, reaches forth and touches the man, saying, I will be thou clean. So we can see that it is the will of Jesus Christ to have healed this man. And he commands that, that sickness, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Hey, you know what? Jesus Christ was not the TV evangelist. He was not that charlatan going around claiming they could heal all these people. You know, when, when you see these TV charlatans going out, you know, and, and, and healing people, there's this like long-winded process. They bring them up on the stage and they say, oh, you know, what's wrong with you? How long have you been suffering with this? You know, what's the issue? And then, you know, they're praying, maybe, maybe in tongues, as it were, in, in their style. And it's a, this long-winded process for entertainment, you know. And then even then, the person comes off the stage not fully recovered. All right? But when we see when Jesus Christ heals someone, it's instantaneous. It's immediate. Okay, he heals them, they're healed, it's not, it's not a show, okay, and, and, and it's immediate. But look at verse number four. And Jesus saith unto him, see thou tell no man. Hey, is that what your TV evangelist wants? <laughs> no, you know, they, they so-called heal someone and they want the whole world, they want, you know, they put on TV for a reason. So everybody can watch and be amazed, wow, look at this healer. But that's not Jesus Christ. He heals them, says, look, tell no man. And the reason I bring this up is because I already mentioned that the whole, um, <clears throat> uh, the multitudes following Christ wasn't his 
uh, intention. It wasn't the preferred way for him to go about doing it. So if he says, tell no man, he's preventing other, others from coming. You know, other great multitudes coming. And as we read through this chapter, you'll notice that Jesus is actually trying to get away from the multitudes. But verse number four, see thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Thank you, brother. It's pretty hot today, huh? It's, it's worse here than it is in Queensland. Can't believe it. All right. So he heals the leper. He commands the man to go see the priest and show himself. Now, that's a commandment. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read to you from Leviticus 14, verse 2, which says, so the instruction to a leper, if they believe they've been cleansed, if they believe they've been healed, it says here, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. So the reason I read that out to you, I just want to show you that Jesus Christ is commanding this leper to go about and, and, and follow through with the law of Moses, to follow through with the Old Testament laws. Because as Jesus Christ was doing all this work, the New Testament had not yet come into effect. The Old Testament was still running, which is why it's, re it's important because we know that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and not to destroy it. And we see that Jesus Christ is very careful to make sure that people are following the law of God. He commands him to go and show yourself to the priest. But he says to him, look, tell no man. Because as you know, if you went around saying, wow, Jesus healed me from my leprosy, you're going to have all these multitudes coming, you know, in addition to the multitudes that were already there. And Jesus Christ was trying to go about his way in an orderly fashion. All right. Jesus Christ was, like I said, trying to get from town to town to city to city. You know, his intention was to go everywhere. Okay. But the great multitudes would slow him down. Let's look at verse number five. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. So now we have a Roman centurion, a Gentile, not a Jew, not an Israelite, you know, but a, a, a Roman centurion, someone that had heard of Jesus Christ. And we know this man had placed his faith on Jesus. We know this is a believer. We know this man is saved because of what Jesus says about this man. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse number six. And saying, what does the Roman centurion say? Lord, my servant, life at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Hey, this is a Roman centurion. This is a man with authority. You know, a centurion is someone that has at least a hundred soldiers under his command maybe more okay and he has servants and we see the heart of this man that he even loves his servants to the fact that this servant is struggling with sickness he goes all the way to find jesus so he could come and heal his servant and jesus says unto him yeah i will come and heal him hey did jesus just come for the jews what do we see in this passage we see this as we go through the gospels chapter by chapter is that yes jesus first came to the jews but if the gentiles came seeking him he made time for them okay and he says look yeah i'll come with you all right i'll, I'll get i'll come away from this multitude that's following me and i'll come and heal your servant your one servant you know of a gentile uh, roman soldier verse number eight and then these are amazing words please you know just just take in the words of the centurion because even the, even these words amaze jesus christ Verse number eight, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Say, why is that relevant? Because we just saw not long ago, Jesus Christ healing a leper. And what, how, did he, how did he heal him? By touching the leper. All right, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But now we see that the Roman centurion come and says to Jesus, look, I know you don't even need to come, Lord. You don't even need to be under my roof. All you need to do is speak your word. You know, I, I have faith in your word, Jesus. I believe in who you are. I believe you just have to say it, Lord, and my servant will be healed. And we see the humility. He realizes having Jesus, having God under his roof is too much for him. He says, Lord, just speak it. I, it's just, you know, and then let's keep reading verse number, verse number nine. He says, for I am a man under authority having soldiers under me and i say to this man go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it and when jesus heard it he marveled 
How, how do you marvel Jesus? How do you marvel God? You know, I, always, I always take uh, time to reflect when Jesus is amazed, when Jesus marveled, this must be significant. And it is. How did he marvel him? When he heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Jesus says, look of this centurion, uh, uh, centurion, Roman centurion. He says, I've not found anyone with greater faith than this man. In all of Israel, in all the Jews, all my disciples, you know, um, everyone that, that he's met across his path, he says, it's this Roman centurion, this Gentile, has the greatest faith that I've seen, you know, yet in Israel. What an amazing thing, you know. And what was it? He believed that Jesus Christ could come and heal his servant. Well, not even come, just speak the word and heal him. And this Roman centurion realizes, hey, look, I'm a man under authority, and I'm a man that has authority. What's he saying about Jesus? I know you have authority. I know you have authority over sicknesses, over the devils, over whatever it is, Lord. You have that authority, and I know I can call on that. I know you can just speak your word, and you can heal my servant. What an amazing faith that this centurion had. Do we have that faith, guys? You know, we read through these stories, but we need to reflect, and how do we apply this to us? You know, do we have that great faith? Do we honestly think when we come before the Lord and we bring our prayers before Him that He can answer it if it's His will? You know, I think sometimes we, because I sometimes have doubts, you know, honestly, you know, just, just, the, just the, the, the flesh of man. You know, I come before the Lord and I bring these requests. And I'm thinking, Lord, can you even answer them? Sometimes there are things that I don't even expect can happen and then they, they get answered. Praise God. You know, sometimes God can work in you even with someone of little faith. In fact, all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. You know, that we, that we read about in the Bible. Let's keep going. Verse number 11. And this is very significant in verse number 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I just have to cover this. I've probably covered it before. Sometimes I get confused with what I've preached here and what I've preached in Queensland because I'm going through the book of Luke over there. So sometimes I get confused. But look, there is an era in our churches, in our, in, our, in our circle of churches, amongst our independent Baptist brethren. Okay? And they have this, this uh, teaching called dispensationalism. I've covered it before. Okay? And one of the dispensational errors is there in verse number 11. It says, in the kingdom of heaven, they'll point to the kingdom of heaven and say, well, that's for the Jews. Okay? Am I right, brother? That's what they say. That's for the Jews. And the kingdom of God, well, that's for the Gentiles. Okay? What do we see here in verse number 11? Who's, who's there in the kingdom of heaven? Yes, Abraham. Yes, Isaac. Yes, Jacob. Praise God. These great men of faith in the Old Testament are there. But who else? That many, many shall come from the east and west. Who is he referring to there? The Roman centurion. Okay, the Gentiles, people that are not from Israel, people that are not the Jews, many will come. That includes you and me, brethren. Unless you're a Jew, then I guess you're fine. But besides that, you know, Gentiles, everyone that has put their faith on Jesus Christ will come and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and, 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 and eat bread in that kingdom of heaven to come. It's an amazing promise. We're going to be able to shake hands with these Old Testament saints that we read about in the Bible. We're like, look at these great men. We're going to sit down with them and have dinner with them. We're going to have lunch, whatever it is that's on the menu. You know, the, the manner of heaven will be there with these people. Look, it's for all. The kingdom of heaven is not just for the Jews. It's for all mankind. Everyone that has put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read to you from, actually you can turn there if you want. Turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Keep your finger in, in Matthew chapter 8 and go to John 10. John 10, 15. John chapter 10, verse 15. The Bible says, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Jesus says, look, I've got other sheep that's not of this fold, referring to the Jews. Okay, I've got other sheep. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Look, Jesus does not have two folds. He doesn't have one fold of the Jews 
And, and you're, you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I've got another photo of the Gentiles of the church age. And you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. And there's this crazy teaching, honestly, that they believe that there's these two groups and they'll never cross paths, even into eternity. You know, when God creates new heavens and new earth, they teach that basically the new earth is for the Jews and the new heaven is for the Gentiles. It's like, what in the world? Look, Jesus Christ has one fold. There is one people of God. Okay, your DNA is irrelevant. Your DNA is irrelevant. Go back to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. In fact, we're all one blood. Okay, why should your DNA make you, any, make you special when we're all of Adam and Eve? We're all of Noah. Okay, in the flesh. But are we saved because of our flesh? No, the Bible says we must be born again. We must be born of the Spirit. We must be a seed of Jesus Christ. Regardless of, of the physical seed that you are. But back to Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, please. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. And then it says this, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The children of the kingdom. Who's he talking about? He's talking of the Jews. Okay? Because it was, the kingdom was, was for the Jews. It, it, Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. He did come to Israel. He did come to show himself the king of kings and the Lord of lords to, to save sinners. He did all these great works in all these towns in Judea. Of course he came for the Jews. But so many of them rejected him. And praise God, many also believed on him. But by and large, Israel as a whole rejected Jesus Christ. And those that rejected him, those that were supposed to be the inheritors of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom, Jesus says they should be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. Okay? And the Bible describes that as a place of darkness as well, by the way. But I won't talk about that right now. It says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? And, and look, praise God if you're saved. You're, you're, you're escaping a place where you would be weeping and gnashing of, of your teeth. I mean, the, the torment would be so great that you'd just be sorrowing all the whole time, regretting the fact that you rejected Jesus, but you're also going to be gnashing your teeth. You're going to be in pain, you know, just grinding your teeth together. Hey, praise God if you're saved, you've avoided this place. And, and, and it's a free gift. What do you have to lose? You know, a free gift. You know, we should understand how important the knowledge that we have is, the gospel is, and the need for us to get out there, guys, because look, there'll be many from the East and the West. We're going to find in, in Australia other people from the East and the West to come and sit down and be part of this kingdom of God. All right? Now, um, please turn to Matthew chapter 3. I just want to show you this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Because the Pharisees just, just never learnt. They just struggled with this teaching the whole time. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So we see, look, this is, this is not the first time even John the Baptist is preaching against the Pharisees. You, yeah, you're physically a child of Abraham. So what? God can make these stones children of Abraham if he wants. All right? Your DNA does not matter. It's not what literally makes you the spiritual children of Abraham. And I'm just going to quickly read to you from Galatians 3.28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hey, I can say to you with full confidence, I am Abraham's seed. Hey, this was written to the Galatians. These are, this was a Gentile church. And he says to the Gentile church, hey, you're Abraham's seed because you're in Christ. You're in Jesus Christ and you're heirs according to the promise. You're heirs of the kingdom of God, the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Praise God that we are. We can say, you know, with full assurance, not because of our DNA, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, that we are children of Abraham. Praise God. Back to Matthew chapter 8, verse 13. Matthew chapter 8, verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, 
so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So now we move on to another story. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, now who's Peter? We know who Peter is, right? He's one of his apostles. And the Roman Catholic Church will say Peter is their first pope, right? And we know that the Roman Catholic popes, you know, they're, they're commanded to be celibate. They're commanded to, to not get married. So let's see what the Roman Catholic Church has to say here. Verse number 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother. What? Wait, wait a second. What wife? Well, Peter had a wife? How can he be the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church? Of course he was not. Okay? That is, that is tradition. That's a myth. That's not true. Peter was married. Peter had a mother-in-law. He saw his, verse number 14, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. So his mother-in-law here is sick with a fever. All right? Verse number 15, and he touched her hand and the fever left her. Now not, notice how quickly when Jesus Christ heals, I mentioned that before, you know, he, he, it's instantaneous. Okay, when Jesus Christ heals. Notice, not just is she healed, but then it says, and she arose and ministered unto them. So you've got this lady who's probably half dead in bed. Jesus Christ comes and heals her. Jesus doesn't even say, hey, take it easy, get your rest, recover your strength. No, her whole strength has been recovered. She's back to full operating mode and she goes and ministers unto them. She goes and serves them maybe a meal and, and water and whatever, you know, cleans their clothes or whatever it is that she was doing to minister to them. Immediately, as soon as she's healed, she was able to go and be productive. You know, and, you know, we can take the application here of salvation. You know, as soon as you place your faith on Christ, it's not some process. It's not like, well, now I'm working to my salvation and I've got to get to a point where I'm saved. No, it's instantaneous. You're saved immediately. You're washed by the blood of the Lamb. And guess what? As soon as you're saved, you're ready to minister. You're ready to go and preach the gospel to your family and friends. You've heard the great news. It's simple. It's a free gift. It's, a, the, it's simplicity in Christ. You can go and minister immediately, just like this woman has. And, and you know, you don't have to be a 10-year a seasoned church member to go soul winning. You can be saved and you can go straight soul winning. You know how you got saved. Just share the same news to, to your loved ones. All right. Verse number 16. And when, uh, sorry, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So, and I don't have too much to build on there, but I'll just read to you from the, the reference that is being referred to there. When it says, uh, spoken of Isaiah the prophet, that's Isaiah 53 verse 4. I'll just read it to you, which says, and, and this is a great chapter of Jesus Christ, but it just says, Surely he have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Something that I didn't really realize until I read the Bible through a few times. You know, we often talk about Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, he died for our sins. You know, he paid the punishment for our sins. But it's more than just that. When you look at it, because look at that in verse number 17. It says, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So when he died on the cross, he also took on our sicknesses, our infirmities, all that pain. You know, and it says there in, in Isaiah 53, not just that, but he carried our sorrows. You know, um, our, our, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. And so, you know, it, it's more than just the sin, but it's basically all the pain. You know, the, the whole curse that was brought on mankind, that was brought on this earth for being sinners, all of that was put on Jesus Christ when he paid for our sins on the cross. Verse 18. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart up unto the other side. So I just want you to notice that. So he's obviously, uh, this is the Sea of Galilee. And um, it says that he's, he's commanded his disciples, because they had ships, to be brought over to the other side of the sea. Say, so why did he do that? Verse 18. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, it got to a point where the, the multitudes were just so great, you know, that he wasn't effective anymore. Obviously, you know, I can lift up my voice, I can preach to you guys, you can hear me. And obviously, if this was a little longer, they'd probably hear me. But if you, if you can imagine if there's a great multitude of people, it'd be hard just to preach. It'd be hard to teach. It'd be hard to get around everybody. Jesus says, we've got to move on from here, guys. So he asked them to take him on a ship to the other side. 
Okay? And on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it was the land of the Gentiles, by the way. We'll look at that now. Verse number 19. So now it's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It says, oh, no, sorry, not yet, not yet. But on, on, as, as I was about to do that, verse 19, it says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Say, why doesn't he have a place to lay his head? Because I told you, Jesus' ministry was to go town to town, city to city. He doesn't know whether that city is going to receive him. If they rejected him, he'd have to continue on to another town. You know, he wouldn't have a, a place that was fixed to lay his head. Verse 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Say, Jesus, that, that's pretty harsh, right? I mean, this guy wants to bury his father. Maybe he's just recently passed away or maybe, maybe he's just waiting for him to pass away. And then he says, I'll follow you, Jesus. All right. Now, we need to be careful with these passages because these are the passages people are going to take to teach a works-based gospel. And as we go through these chapters, I'm always telling you, I'm showing you how people use verses to teach a works-based gospel. Because they'll say, well, look, here, you actually have to follow after Jesus you have to keep his commands, follow his ways. You know, you've, you've got to leave everything behind in order for you to become his disciple. Now, there's a truth to that. Okay? But we know salvation is not by being a disciple. Discipleship is something that happens after you're saved. The other thing you need to understand when you read through the Gospels is that this is the three-year ministry of Jesus Christ physically on the earth. His disciples were literally following him his disciples had literally left their full-time jobs the you know the fishermen have left fishing and and uh you know matthew had left the uh, you know left from being a publican from being a tax collector he left it to follow jesus these guys literally left everything behind because they they jesus was was moving he was going from town to town if you went like lord i'm gonna have to bury my father by the time you got back jesus was already moved on he was already gone this isn't a time where people had cars. We could just easily transport and work out where is Jesus and get in a car and, and, and no. You know, if you wanted to follow Jesus in this point in time, you literally had to leave it all and put him first, okay? And follow after him. Now in saying that, there is a principle for us, okay? The more you want to serve Christ with your life, and if you ever want to get into full-time ministry into a church, become a deacon, a pastor, whatever, you got to count the cost. You know, the more you want to do for the Lord, the more it's going to cost you, the more you have to give up of your life. Now, if you just want to be a faithful church member, praise God, that's awesome. You know, it's going to cost you a couple of hours every week. You know, if you want to be a soul winner, you want to go and knock doors, you know, you want to do that. Yeah, praise God, that's, you know, you're commanded of you to do that. But it's going to cost you another few more hours. You say, I want to be a preacher, maybe not a pastor, but just a preacher. Good. You know, it's going to cost you a good amount of hours preparing a sermon every week. That's fine. But notice, the more you want to serve the Lord, the more you want to follow after Him, the more you want to get into full-time ministry, you've got to understand it's going to cost you. Okay? It's going to cost time away from maybe your family so you can focus on, on preparing uh, for sermons or whatever. It's going to take time away from you, you know? That's something you just have to understand. But please, don't think you have to not bury your father in order for you to do that because that was something specific for that time, okay? But hey, there might be the, there might be the situation where your family is literally holding you back from serving God. You know, you might have grown up in a family that's, that's unsaved, that's not Christian, you know, and, and they hate the fact that you're saved, they hate the fact that you're going to church. Uh, yeah, that, there might come a time where you literally have to say, guys, I have to put you behind because I've got to put God first. You know, and that, that can be a realistic thing as well for you, you know. Uh, one example of this is, you know, in 2017, before I became a pastor, before I was ordained, I went to South America, Chile for three months. Uh, to see my relatives, to see my uncles and cousins and all that stuff there. And the reason I did that for three months was I knew as soon as I became a pastor that I wasn't going to find three months of holiday ever again. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I, it's not like uh, becoming a pastor, you can just like take holidays. And I don't think it's a good thing to do. I mean, e even when you look at the Old Testament, you look at Moses, you know, and, and Moses is a good example of a Old Testament pastor. You know, he went up to, into the Mount to get the Ten Commandments of the Lord. He was gone for 40 days. And he came back, what happened to the church? What happened to the congregation? They set up a, a golden a calf and they were worshipping that golden calf. You know, so I, I don't believe it's wise for a pastor to be gone away for a long time. You know, um, I was thinking even in July to go to a, a conference in, um, uh, I forget where it is, California or whatever. 
But then I realized in July here, this church has its one year anniversary. So I'm going to bring my family here for a couple of weeks. And then I thought, okay, I can do that for a couple of weeks. And maybe I'll go to the conference afterwards. There'll be another two weeks that I'll be gone. Nah, I'm not going to come back to a church worshiping a golden calf. You know, I don't think it's the right thing to do. I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, but still, I think the principle is there in the Old Testament. I think it's a good lesson. You know, you shouldn't be gone for too long of a time and leave the church behind. But something that I had to realize, I, had to, I, I re- came to realize, man, when I become a pastor, I'm going to have to forego a lot of things that I, that I want. And that's why I went for the three-month holiday. You know, got that out of the way. So my family might be the last time I see my family and just come and faithfully serve the church and our churches, you know. So, you know, if you have a mind, if you're thinking about that, you know, I'm thinking about being a pastor one day, you gotta understand, there's a cost. There's a cost involved, okay, in following after Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, and he was, but he was asleep. Hey, guys, the lesson here... We all have turmoils in life. We're all going to go through trials and tribulations in our life. But you know what? It's possible to sleep like a baby. It's possible to just lay your head at night and go to sleep and not let the turmoils bother, bother you that much. The only way to do that, we see Jesus able to do that. We see Jesus on the ship, the storms, and he's just asleep. He's fast asleep. The only way you're going to get through turmoils in life and get your, get your baby sleep all right, and, and be rested is if you're in close fellowship with Jesus. Okay, you've got to be in close fellowship with Jesus. Let's keep reading. Verse 25. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We perish. If I was on that ship, that'd be me. Because I'm not a very good swimmer. All right? I'd be going to Jesus. Lord, you know, save us. We perish. Verse 26. And he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? that even those winds and the sea obey him. Wow. You know, Jesus Christ can command nature, the winds, the seas, and they obey him. I'll say this. You're smarter. You're, 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 you're a much greater creation than the winds and the sea. But they're able to obey Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, when we look at ourselves, when we sin, when we fail, you know, that's, that we come to a point where we've not obeyed Christ. We've disobeyed Christ. You know? And it's like that these disciples just reflect that upon themselves. They're like, man, how can he control nature? How can nature obey the voice of Jesus Christ? But that should be us. We should be saying, hey, we need to be obeying Christ. You know, and when we sin, we should be, you know, God, I failed you. you know, put your hand up, confess your sins, and, and ask for forgiveness. Verse 28. And by the way, Jesus Christ mentioned there they didn't have enough faith. You know, in comparison to the to the, the Roman centurion. I would have loved to see how the Roman centurion would have handled that situation. If he had the greatest faith and he was on that ship, I reckon he would have been calm. I reckon he would have been in control. Don't worry, Jesus is on the ship. You know, I think he would have been just fine. But let's keep reading verse number 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the um, Gurgenses, Gurgen, Gurgenses, they met him too possessed with devils. By the way, this country is the, a country of Gentiles, okay? We're not in a place of Jews right now. And the reason we know this is because they're also farming swine, pigs. And we know that the Jews, obviously, the pigs were an unclean animal in the Old Testament. So we know we're in the land of the Gentiles here. They met him too possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by the way. Now, this story is recorded in three Gospels. And I've heard this story used to say that the Bible has contradictions, all right? Because in the Gospels of Mark and Luke, the same story is there, but it only speaks of one man coming, okay? But in the book of Matthew, it talks about two possessed with devils coming to see him. Now, that's not a contradiction, all right? What's happening here, and I'll explain this a little bit later, but what's happening here is that um, the Gospel of Matthew is, is highlighting that there were two of them, but the Gospels of Mark and Luke basically just focus on one. Okay, even though it's talking about one, it's not saying there was only one. It's just focused on that one, one and, we, and we'll see why later on. Let's keep reading. Verse 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And I just want you to notice there that even the devils know that Jesus is the Son of God. All right? 
I mean, they're not saying Jesus the Father. They're not saying Jesus the Holy Spirit. They're saying Jesus, thou Son of God. And something else they admit to, uh, thou come hither to torment us before the time. You know the devils of this world know they've already lost the war. You know, they, they already know they're defeated. They already know they're going to be cast into that lake of fire forever, tormented forever. They know that it's Jesus Christ that's going to come and torment them. They already know that, okay? And right now, they're just trying to cause as much destruction as possible, all right? But we don't need to be afraid of devils, okay? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, okay? You have the Holy Ghost indwelling the believer. We have the power of God in us. We don't need to be afraid of devils. But notice, they know. They know they've lost, okay? And, uh, but I also want you to realize the devils can say to Jesus that he is the Son of God. And you need to be careful of the people you listen to the preachers that you listen to, the churches that you attend, because there are many false teachers that have gone into the world, okay, that will say good things, that will say true things. These guys, the devils are saying the truth. That the two things they say are true, that Jesus is the Son of God and they're going to be tormented by Him. Those things are true, okay, but it's devils that are speaking. So you need to be careful when, when, when you listen to preachers or you decide to pick up a book and read it, that you make sure this person's saved, make sure this person's got the right gospel, first of all, and then listen to that person. Because even devils, even demon-possessed people can say some truth. But then they'll still twist, they'll twist it, they'll bring corruption, they'll bring heresy. So you've got to be careful. And listen, if someone's not saved, don't, don't listen to them. Don't be like, well, they're not saved, I won't listen to them about the gospel. But they've got other good material about other things. Don't go there. It's probably full of heresy. It's probably full of lies. Why would, you, why would you risk that? You know, why would you risk that when you've got good men of God that are saved, that are preachers? Now that we have the internet, there are a lot of good preachers online. You know, find the best people that you can find. Listen to them. But be mindful of who you listen to. Let's keep reading. Verse number 30. And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So there was a bunch of pigs that were feeding uh, so the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. So we see so, much, so many great works of God here. We see Jesus healing leprosy, healing the sick, casting out devils. Right? We see him doing all these. And, and even you know, commanding nature to stop and that, they, that it calms down for him. And now we see that even the devils obey Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ tells them, yeah, you can go. And so they go. They ask him for permission, as it were. It's just amazing. You know, what manner of man is this? You know, this Jesus Christ that we serve. Praise God that, you know, we serve the Lord God. And then it says in verse 33, so, so yeah, sorry, the, the devils go into the pigs, the pigs then for whatever reason, it's like they panic, they run into the sea, they perish in the water. And then verse 33, And they that kept them fled. So the farmers of these pigs, they, they flee, and went their ways into the city, and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Hey, what manner of man was there? They, he came, he could heal. He had a great message of salvation. And yet these people could see the authority. They were afraid of him. And they said, look, leave this city. We don't want you here. It's a sad thing. And that's the reality, guys. When you go door to door soul winning, there's going to be those that receive you. There's going to be those that reject you. All right? And we don't have it so much here. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, he would be part of the coast. And yeah, Jesus Christ obliges. He says, all right, I'm leaving. I'm going. And he ends up leaving. Can you guys turn to Luke chapter 8, please? Luke chapter 8. Because I want to show you just one difference here with the story that we see in, in Matthew and also in, in Luke. So remember I told you in Luke, Luke chapter 8, verse 38. Go to Luke chapter 8, verse 38. Remember in Luke I said it focuses on the one man. Okay? So let's understand this. Luke chapter 8, verse 38. It says, Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, So, Jesus heals two men that we know that from the book of Matthew. Okay? But in the book of Luke, he focuses on the one man. And this one man comes to Jesus after he's healed of the devils. He comes and says he wants to be with Jesus. He says, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be a disciple. I want to follow you. But notice Jesus says, but Jesus sent him away. 
why, why is that? Why did Jesus send him away? Well, we already know that the men of the city asked Jesus to leave. They didn't want Jesus to be there. So Jesus says, he sends him away saying, look at verse 39. Return to thine own house and show how great things God have done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. So this is why the other gospels focus on the one man, because it's this one man that wants to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, no, you stay in the city. I've been asked to leave. We know that Jesus leaves, but he leaves this one man that was healed of the devils to stay in his city and publish the great works of Jesus Christ. Hey, he was a soul winner for that city. All right, so we can see, look, this man was not asked to leave everything behind. In fact, this man was asked to stay in the city, stay with your family, stay with your friends, and be out there preaching the gospel. You know? And today, guys, we don't have Jesus Christ on this earth today, walking the earth like we, you know, back then. But Jesus Christ has left us here. We have a job in this city, in this city of, of Sydney, okay, to publish the great works of Jesus Christ, to be soul winners. You know? That's what we've been left to do, just like this man that was possessed of the devils. Right, so I hope that gives you some things to think about in this chapter. Uh, let's pray.